Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Zebart Lecture 2023. My name is Duncan Large, and I'm the Academic Director of BCLT, the British Centre for Literary Translation at the University of East Anglia in Norwich, England. The Zebart Lecture is an annual event organised by BCLT. It was inaugurated in 1994 as the St. Jerome Lecture and renamed in 2006 after BCLT's founder, the renowned German language novelist, W.G. Max Sebald. We're able to bring the lecture to you again this year free of charge, thanks to the sponsorship of Arts Council England through our continuing core partnership with the National Centre for Writing in Norwich. As ever, we're also tremendously grateful to the British Library for their expertise and their digital hospitality. For the fourth year in succession, we're holding the Zebart Lecture online, which has the advantage of making it available to a global audience. So a very warm welcome to you wherever you are. The lecture is being recorded and will be available after the event on the British Library website and the BCLT YouTube channel. For the Zebat Lecture each year, we invite a prominent cultural figure to speak about literary translation from their personal perspective. This afternoon, it's my great pleasure and honor to introduce to you this year's Zebat Lecturer, Alberto Mangel. Alberto Mangel is an Argentine-born Canadian writer, translator, editor, and critic who is the acclaimed author of The Library at Night and A History of Reading. He's written over 20 works of criticism and edited more than 30 literary anthologies. He's the author of six novels, including News from a Foreign Country Came, which won the McKittrick Prize. He's translated works by, among others, Amin Malouf, Anna Zegas, Philippe Solers, and Marguerite Yossenal into English, Catherine Mansfield and Arnold Wesker into Spanish. A commander, uh, commander de l'Ordre des Arts et des Lettres and Officer of the Order of Canada, he's also been awarded the Fomento Prize, the Gutenberg Prize, and a Guggenheim Fellowship. He's a member of the Argentine Academy of Letters, the Royal Spanish Academy, and the Royal Society of Literature in the United Kingdom. From 2016 to 2018, Alberto Mangel was director of the National Library in his native Argentina, following in the footsteps of Borges. And he's now director of the Espaso Atlantida, the Center for the Study of the History of Reading in Lisbon, Portugal which is also the new home for his personal library of over 40,000 titles. Last academic year, he was a visiting professor at the Collège de France, and his inaugural lecture was published by Feuillard as Europe, le mythe comme métaphore. His next book in English is a biography of Maimonides, which is forthcoming in May from Yale University Press. In a moment, I'll hand over to Professor Mangel, who will deliver his lecture from Lisbon. After the lecture, he's kindly agreed to take questions from our live audience, and we'll try to take as many questions as possible. So if you would like to put a question to our speaker, then I invite you to use the question box below the video on your screens, uh, which will be live throughout the lecture. The lecture also has live captions, which you can access by clicking the Enable Captions button. For now, though, let me hand over to Alberto Mangel to give the Zebart Lecture 2023 with the title Notes on the Art of Translation. Hello, I'm Alberto Mangel, and I'm very honored to be giving this Zebart Lecture. I met Sebald um, a few months before his death, and we had uh, a bit of a correspondence and some fascinating conversations. I discovered the work of Sebald thanks to Christopher McElholz, who published him in England for the first time. And 
in the rings of Saturn, I found um, a, a, a couple of sentences that I think implicitly define translation. In that book, Sevold says, as I looked round about me, it was the representation of history that I saw. It requires a falsification of perspective. We, the survivors, see everything from above, see everything at once, and still we do not know how it was. I think translators will sympathize with this. What I decided to do is not give a straightforward lecture, but pick a few words that I think um, can help for an understanding of what translation is. And so I've called this a few notes uh, on the definition of the art of translation. So the first word is correct. Art comes into being because language is doomed to failure. Balzac tells the story of a painter who, obsessed with achieving the perfect masterpiece, continues to revise his painting until, in the end, there is nothing but a mass of muddy colors on his canvas. Unlike a correct vision in the mind's eye, correct visions in the execution of a craft are condemned to imperfection. We dream of that which, correct in every sense, may come into being through our labors in shape, color, music, and words, but it never does. But precisely because a state of correctness can never be attained, art admits a secret sharer, a viewer, a listener, a reader. The art of translation reminds readers that there is never a correct reading. We know that every literary text exists in the moment of its coming into being and then falls into a kind of hibernation of suspended budding until a reader comes and brings it back to life but to a life that mirrors the variety of the reader's own experience and understanding. Balzac read by Freud is not Balzac read by Marx. Even within a single reading, in a single language, words carry more meanings than any reader can hold at one time. In English, fast means to move quickly and also to remain still. In French, le ton denotes both a quality of sound and a quality of color. In Spanish, bala is a bullet and the bleating of a sheep. In Japanese, the word say means at least 28 different things, each distinct and definable. In fact, every word in any language translates not as one, but as a whole anthology of meanings. In Greek, anthology means a bunch of flowers. Saint. According to the golden legend, Saint Mark the Evangelist wrote his gospel as he had heard it from the lips of his master, Saint Peter, and Peter, after examining the written text and finding it without fault, approved it for instruction of all Christians. Mark's gospel is in this sense not an original composition, but a written translation of Peter's spoken words, which in turn were a translation of the voice of the Holy Ghost. All translation is transportation. In the Middle Ages, translatio meant the moving of a saint's relics from one place to another. Translation as displacement, as the restoring to a sign its nomadic nature 
as the uprooting of something sacred from the site in which it lay and resettling it in another territory. Translation as, as movement, translation as immigration. Like the carriers of relics, translators strip a text of its external appearance and transplant it in the soil of their own language. The new context both transforms and preserves the text, gives it a new skin, translation as metaphor, metaphor in Greek and translation in Latin are of course the same word. The translatio of holy remains was sometimes a furta sacra, the act of stealing relics for the benefit of one's own society. Famously, in 468, the body of St. Mark was stolen from the Egyptians in Alexandria and taken to Venice under a load of pork meat, which the Muslim border guards refused to touch. Thus, Venice was enriched. Translators, like thieves, appropriate what is not theirs in order to enrich their own linguistic homeland. Piracy in the name of patriotism. Tom, does a translator disturb a text? A text is in constant turmoil, trapped within the margins of the page. It is let loose by the readers who allow it the free run of their imaginative landscapes. Its only limits are those of the reader's common sense. In the translator's eye, a text can become anything. Prose can become poetry, political tracts can become fiction, fiction theology, private memoirs, official history, official history fable. The reader or the translator transforms the text endlessly, layer after layer after layer of skin. The translator replaces one condition of turmoil with another. A translator's choice can never be the last. Only between readings does a text attain a state of calm. After the author has finished his rutting and marked the culmination with the words, the end, and before the translator takes the book and opens it up to an erotic gesture to excite the words into a new storm of passion, the text lies in a state of suspended animation, peaceful in its glass coffin like Sleeping Beauty. The role of the translator is that of the awakening prince. A story collected in the medieval Japanese anthology, Konjaku Monogatori Shu, tells of a man who in his youth saw something scarlet floating down the river. When he picked it up, he saw it was a persimmon leaf reddened by the frost and that it bore a poem. Struck by the beauty of the verses, the young man fell in love, and not knowing how to establish with the unknown author an amorous relationship, he composed a different version of the poem, that is to say a translation, in the same rhymes, copied it out on another leaf, and floated it on the water for the current to bear away. Between the turmoil of love that inspired the first poem and the turmoil of love that inspired the response, the two leaves floating on the river restored the poem and its translation to a state of expectant calm. Pure. On the 17th night of the month of Ramadan in the year 610, a happily married middle-aged merchant found himself in a cave on the slopes of Mount Hira near Mecca. He had fallen asleep when suddenly he heard a voice commanding him to recite. Unable to speak, the merchant remained silent. 
Once again, the voice commanded him, recite. Once more, the merchant said nothing. A third time, the voice commanded, recite. In the name of the Lord thy God, who created man from a drop of blood, recite. Thy Lord is most bountiful, who by means of the pen taught man what he knew not. This time, unable to resist, Muhammad spoke the first verse of the Quran. Dictated by God himself, the Quran is one of God's attributes, like his omnipresence and his omniscience. When written in the ancient Arabic tongue, it is the physical representation of another hidden Quran that mystics call the mother of the book. Because the Quran is inimitably pure, it cannot be reproduced in any other language or form because it was revealed to Muhammad in Arabic. It must only be recited in that tongue. A pure text cannot exist as such in another language. It can only be interpreted or glossed in foreign versions where a number of different meanings is given to the original words. The Holy Quran in a language other than Arabic cannot be called the Holy Quran, only the meaning of the Holy Quran. Purity is often contested. The first translations of the Quran were produced in order to deny it. In the ninth century, Nicetas Byzantius, a scholar from Constantinople, composed a translation into Greek under the title Refutation of the Quran. Three centuries later, Robert of Ketan, at the request of the abbot of Cluny, made a translation into Latin, which he called Lex Mahomet Pseudo Prophete, the law of Muhammad, the false prophet, in which he deliberately mistranslated certain passages in order to better refute them. When Kitten's work was published in the 16th century, it carried a preface by Martin Luther. In a tongue that is not its own, a text can never claim to be pure, and even then. The name. On Mount Horeb, according to the book of Exodus, an angel appeared to Moses in the midst of a burning bush that was not consumed. Astonished, Moses turned aside to see the wonder, and the voice of God spoke to him from the flames and told him to take off his sandals because he was treading holy ground. Then God said his name was Yahweh, so that Moses might know with certainty who was addressing him. Scholars have long debated the translation of God's name. Some render it as he who is he, others, I who am I, or I am who I am, or even we who are who we are. Talmudist commentators take this to mean that God is only equivalent to himself, which is another way of saying that his name is he who is everything, or as Odysseus put it to the Cyclops, he who is no one, since God in his totality cannot be one single thing, not even his totality. No doubt in God's vocabulary, everything and nothing are synonymous. For the masters of the Kabbalah, keen on Hebrew etymology, Yahweh means he who blows to make things fall as if God were his own whirlwind, determined to destroy his own work. Such all-embracing solutions feel strangely unsatisfactory. For that reason, perhaps, rabbinical scholars understood 
that to find an accurate translation of God's name would be to approach the ineffable understanding of his veiled and incomprehensible nature. If I knew him, I would be him, wrote 15th century philosopher José Albo. And yet the story has a footnote. When Moses hears God speak to him and tell him to instruct the people of Israel, he pleads ignorance and lack of eloquence. I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. Who have made man's mouth, God asks him with something of a swagger. Or who maketh the dumb, or deaf, or the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. This is the illumination that translators hope for, that the name that is everything or nothing will grant their understanding something of the meaning of the received text, something that they, in spite of their humble gifts, may put into believable words for us to read. To swear. To translate is to swear by the original text. In the Germanic tongues, the etymology of to swear is to answer. A translation is an answer to the questions posed by the original. Montaigne, somewhere in his essay, tells the story of a Spanish peasant who, being put to the rack as accomplice to the murder of the praetor Lucius Peace Piso, cried out in the height of his torment, that his friends should not leave him, but look on in all assurance, and that no pain had the power to force from him one word of confession. This was all they could get the first afternoon. The next day, as they were leading him to his second trial, the peasant disengaged himself from the hands of his guards and furiously ran his head against the wall, beating out his brains. What Montaigne does not tell us is that the peasant insisted on his right to swear his declaration, not in Latin, the Latin of his masters, but in the Celts-Iberian languages of his forefathers. The peasant believed that even to deny an accusation by not saying a word, his silence should be heard in his own tongue. Swearing in a court of law, even in an unrecognized or unfair court of law, demands the absence of verbal intermediaries. The Spanish peasant felt that the gods, his gods, and also those the Roman soldiers had carried across the Pyrenees, would not admit the impertinence of a translation. Montaigne was not certain of the advantages of translation. While he confessed an ignorance of Greek and Hebrew and was grateful to be able to read the Greek classics in French, he judged the various translations of the Bible dangerous undertakings, where he found the risk of misinterpretation greater than that of impenetrability. In the case of divine scripture, Montaigne seems to have valued reverence over comprehension. Montaigne praised a certain Portuguese scholar, Osorio da Fonseca, as the greatest historian of his age. He was not aware that Osorio's magnum opus, the Rebus Emanuelis Regis, was an almost word-for-word -word translation of the history of King Manuel, penned, as Edward Wilson Lee reminds us, by the now forgotten royal archivist, Damião de Gois. Translation as an answer often forgets the original question. Politics. <laughs> 
We read what we want to read. Divination and the art of translation are closely related, and every text can be made to say what the reader imagines or requires. All translation is a form of exegesis. All translation is a political act. To protect the classics from the contamination of Sodom and Gomorrah, translators from the Middle Ages onwards have chosen to read them with an amending eye. According to the scholar John Boswell, Socrates' handsome companion Alcibiades appeared occasionally in medieval literature as a woman. In a manuscript of Ovid's Art of Love, the phrase that originally read, a boy's love appealed to me less, was changed to a boy's love appealed to me not at all, and the scribe insisted in the margin. Thus, you may be sure that Ovid was not a sodomite. Michelangelo's homosexual love sonnets were transformed into heterosexual ones by his nephew, who altered the loving pronouns. The Persian verses of Saadi underwent the same sex change as did the gazelles of Hafiz all the way up to the mid 20th century. The prestigious Loeb series of the Greek classics until recently translated homosexual passages not into English, but into Latin. And at times, their translator must invent in order to censor. In his translation of Suetonius, Robert Gray's included an English version of a non-existent clause to suggest that Roman law prohibited homosexual acts. Much the same devices were used in other contexts to suppress or change an undesired meaning. In the Third Reich, the names of Jewish writers were often suppressed or changed in the publication of their books. Heinrich Heine's famous poem, The Lorelei, was published as an anonymous folk song in order to avoid attributing a German literary classic to a Jew. Such gestures, too, are the politics of translation. Betrayal. Belaboring the old Italian saying, traditore, traditore, Joachim du Bellay in the 16th century added to the opprobrious idea of treason that of theft. But what should I say of some more worthy of being called traitors than translators, since they betray those whom they undertake to render explicit, robbing them of their glory, and by the same means seduce ignorant readers, showing them white for black? An example. During the conquest and looting of Mexico, Hernán Cortés, like Du Bellay, mingled the concepts of theft, translation, and treason in his campaigns. Fray Bartolomé de las Casas, author of A Brief Account of the Destruction of the Indies, tells how one day, when Cortés was in need of communicating with the chiefs, a native woman was presented to him who could speak the tongues of various regions. Cortés had a Spanish lieutenant who had learned the language of Yucatán. The woman understood it and also spoke that of Tabasco. In order to communicate with the chiefs of Tabasco, Cortés would give his message to his lieutenant, who in turn would relay it to the Indian woman, who then would translate it into the language of Tabasco. The woman's name was Malinche. The Spaniard called her Marina. For many years, La Malinche was the companion of Cortés, his interpreter and guide, after which he gave her as a gift to one of his officers. Later, when the officer returned to Spain, Cortés took her to live with him again, 
and they had a son whom Cortes much loved and who was to become governor of Santiago. Historians have portrayed La Malinche in many guises as brave heroine, foul betrayer, faithful convert, cunning spy, loving concubine, exemplary servant of the Spanish crown. As a bridge between the tongues of the new and the old worlds, neither fully native nor entirely European, La Malinche stands as an emblem of the translator's role. La Malinche's name derives from that of the 12th month of the Aztec calendar, associated with the South and with the weaving of stalks or string. Translation, theft, treason, all three woven like strands of string in the founding of the new language of the Americas. Blending order. Translation is, in its very nature, sequential, one version superseding another as in a palimpsest, and cannot pretend to ever being the last. And yet we attempt to lend a common order to all translations, to label some as literal, others as free versions, others still as bel infidel. But no translation is uniquely of one sort, or not for long. Pope's Homer was considered an outrageous experiment. Today, it is regarded as a classic. The versions Ezra Pound made of Anglo-Saxon poetry seemed imaginative then and accurate now. Rilke's rendering of Louise Labbe's poem were read as translations. Now we know that they are originals by Rilke, inspired by the poet of Lyon. It seems impossible to order them precisely. To translate Aristotle's Euphemia as good, Virgil's Arma Virorumque as arms and the man, Shakespeare's to be or not to be as être ou ne pas être, is no doubt to translate properly, except that euphemia denotes a certain contented joyfulness not evident in good. Virgil's words implies the privileges of a social rank and sex that arms in the man democratizes. And Hamlet is not merely choosing between life and death, but between accepting or not accepting his own existence, both in space and time, in the world as in the mind. Each language unfolds differently and for different emotional and grammatical reasons. To speak of a correct translation is a, a bureaucratic label, not an aesthetic demand, and translators are not bureaucrats unless they mean to fail. They work mostly in secret and their names are rarely recalled even when, thanks to their talents, a book crosses the borders of its language and becomes part of another nation's treasure. In a posthumously collected short story, Proofs of Holy Writ, Kipling describes Shakespeare collaborating with his friend Ben Jonson on the translation of the Bible of King James. Who will know we had a part in it, asks Ben Johnson, after the two have worked on a few verses from Messiah. God, maybe, answers Shakespeare, if he ever lay ear to earth. House. Dante believed that no translation could ever be moved from its original dwelling, because when it text is composed for the first time, whether successfully or not, the eye of the muse guides the hand of the poet, and the house that the poet builds out of words has exactly the right number of doors and windows, and rises to the intended height of its beams. Dante preferred not to read Homer like many of his contemporaries. He had no Greek rather than read him under a translated roof, but that does not prevent him from granting Homer pride of place 
in the noble castle of the first circle of the inferno, where the good pre-Christian souls live in something like quiet resignation. Let everyone know that what is harmonized by the muse cannot be translated without breaking its sweetness and its harmony, he wrote in the Convivio. This is the reason why the verses in the Psalter lack the sweetness of music and harmony, because they were translated from the Hebrew into Greek and from the Greek into Latin and from the very first translation on all sweetness is sapped away. For Dante, a new lodging built for the text by a translator was preferable to one in which the original were forced to reside, sullied by improprieties. Centuries later, Voltaire refused to believe that a translator should build his house of words reproducing every brick of the original. Curses! on the authors of literal translations, who transcribe each and every word, stripping it of its sense, he wrote. Here we can accurately say that the letter kills the spirit and the spirit gives life. Star. Every translator follows his own star or her own star. There is an island off the coast of New Guinea that the Dutch explorers in the 16th century named Salamander Island. Early chronicles report that the natives of Salamander were as savage as any on earth and spoke a tongue marvelously different from any other. In 1859, a missionary from Antwerp settled among them intent on bringing the word of God to these forsaken people. It took him many months to learn their language, and once he had mastered it, he began to translate into their tongue St. Paul's epistle to the Ephesians, in which the apostle entreats the heathen to follow the Lord, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as servants of Christ. For several years, this man translated the holy words into the tongue of the salamander people, laboring day and night. But the flesh is weak. One by one, the natives fell victims to a mild form of smallpox that the missionary had contracted before his journey. On the day the missionary completed his labors, and the last word of the epistle had been penned in the alien tongue, the sole remaining salamander native took to his hut never to emerge again, except as a corpse to be buried with his fellows who had gone before him to what they called the sea beyond the sea. The missionary had completed his translation in a tongue that but for himself now no one spoke. Every translator follows his or her own star, and so does every language. Law. The writer writes, a certain idea, a certain story comes to the writer's mind in an image like a garden glimpsed one afternoon from the window of a train. It is only an instant, but the mind's eye continues to see the garden that changes almost imperceptibly, becomes less and less defined. The writer attempts to put that vision into words quickly before the garden vanishes a second time or is transformed beyond recognition. Writers translate the garden into text, choosing the words to name what they believe they saw overlapping the shifting vision with a term for each drifting piece. A tree becomes a tree, a hedge becomes a hedge, a flower becomes a flower. Now other words assist in translating the hues, the shapes, the contrasts, tall, green, budding, dark, low, as red as a ruby. The words themselves are not enough. Comparisons and metaphors are brought in to deepen and broaden the picture in the end, there is a garden, but it is nothing like the fleeting garden now no longer remembered. 
The translation from image to words falls upon an only half conscious system of creation. Writers know what they are doing, but never fully understand the system. Some words are used for reasons they can explain, others for reasons they can't, in which case they make the reasons up. Every artist poetica entails lying. The truth is that the writer never knows fully why. The translation from one group of words to another requires a somewhat stricter system, since meaning must be taken into account and not only appearance. The translator must take apart consciously what the writer has built in a haze of precarious understanding. Nuances must be clarified, stresses must be given their exact pitch, subtle weavings must be unthreaded and woven together again, this time with an explicit motive. The laws of translation are sterner than those of writing because they include the laws of writing. Translation is the superior court of law. Here, no slips of the tongue are forgiven. In translation, the garden of the first afternoon might even acquire again something of its primordial clarity. Fair weather. Translation can be a form of censorship, of enhancement, of deprivation, of metamorphosis. It can also be an instrument for changing moods, intentions, and morals. Confronted with the original, the translator can choose to ignore not only certain words or even paragraphs, but certain consequences and endings as well. In translation, Cordelia and Lear need not die. Don Quixote may not remember he is Alonso Quijano. Madame Bovary can eschew suicide and even adultery. In the celebrated translation by Constance Garnett that brought the great Russian novelist to the English public at the turn of the 19th century, Dostoevsky's infamous heroes and Tolstoy's babbling scoundrels speak with the clear diction of the bourgeois drawing room. In Galland's translations of the Arabian Nights, not only are the more erotic scenes purged, but a simpering refinement creeps into the behavior of thieves and rogues. Afraid that children might be frightened, as well they should be, by the dark stormy nights in the forests of Grimm's fairy tales, the translator Gomez Estrada decided to let the light shine in those gloomy regions. In his version, Snow White escapes through a sunny grove. Hansel and Gretel lose themselves in a springtime arbor. He also gave Bluebeard a secret chamber full of gold coins instead of slaughtered wives and turned the sadistic murderer into a miser instead of a ledger. Lauded from the pulpit, his versions became known as the Fair Weather Tales. Honest. What is an honest translation? Umberto Eco once pointed out that if he ever were to commission a new translation of Pinocchio into English, and the translator brought him a text beginning Two households, both alike in dignity in fair Verona, he would feel he had the right to refuse the translation because, as a translation, the new text would not be honest. Perhaps translations cannot be honest, since they must by needs hide the original appearance of a text. I believe, says Don Quixote towards the end of the second part of his adventures, that when translating from one tongue to the other, except from those queens of tongues, Greek and Latin, the translator behaves like one who looks at Flemish tapestries from the rear, where even though the figures are indeed perceived, they are full of threads that obscure them and they do not appear 
with the smoothness and hue of the front. To do something behind one's back means being dishonest. The contrary is to show one's face. Most of the time, translators don't show their face. During the 19th century, at a meeting of his Dyson clergy, the Reverend Richard Watley accused his brethren of dishonesty. He held up a copy of the authorized version of the Bible and announced in a thunderous voice, this gentleman is not the Bible. And when his audience gasped in pious astonishment, he resolutely added, this is only a translation of the Bible. Force to translate a text is to force it to comply with a certain specific reading. An example. In 1858, the poet Edward Fitzgerald sent his translation of Omar Khayyam's Rubaiyat to the editor of Fraser's magazine. A year passed and hearing nothing, he asked for the manuscript to be returned and had it printed at his own expense. Since no copy sold, the little book ended up in the penny box outside a second-hand booksellers, where the poets Dante Gabriel Rossetti and Algernon Charles Swinburne found it, read it, and proclaimed it a classic. Soon afterwards, the price of the booklet rose from a penny to a guinea, and then even higher. Thanks to Rossetti and Swinburne, two reputations were simultaneously made that of Omar Khayyam and that of Edward Fitzgerald. And the Rubaiyat quickly became one of the most frequently quoted and best loved works in English literature. But who is the author? Omar Khayyam was a Persian poet of the 12th century who composed a series of rubais or quatrains on human transience and the pleasures of the present moment. Edward Fitzgerald was a quiet Englishman who studied Greek, Spanish, and Persian, wrote amusing letters to his friends, and never traveled abroad. Readers have coupled both names to refer to the author of the Rubaiyat, and it is true that while the original poem is Kayam's, Fitzgerald transformed and added much to his version in English. We accept that a cathedral, a dramatic performance, a concert, are the work of more than one artist. We seldom attribute collective authorship to a literary work, especially one in which the collaborators working on different continents are separated by a gap of seven centuries. Valéry proposed that all literature should be regarded as the work of one author using many pseudonyms and having eclectic tastes. If that is the case, under the pseudonym Kayam Fitzgerald, the author composed one of the great works of English literature, which read in one sense is a classical example of medieval Persian wisdom and in another, a typical instance of 19th century British Orientalism. The ambiguity is also its force. Death. Inscribed in the very creation of a text is the hope of resurrection. This coming back to life is an endless process. Reader after reader opens the book on the first page, and all the successive reawakenings become part of the text itself. We never read the original text, we read the enfolded history of its readings and rereadings. But first the text must die. Jean-Paul Sartre tells how at the age of five, he realized that death was watching him with its nose pressed against the window. After that, he had an assignation with death every night in his bed. It was a ritual he felt he had to accomplish. He had to sleep on his left side, face to the wall, 
and wait, trembling all over for death to appear. When it did, it took the form of a conventional skeleton. Only after he had seen it did Sartre feel he had permission to turn onto his right side. Death would then disappear and he could fall asleep. This is the ritual every translator too must accomplish. Allow death to appear in the text, the letters inanimate, the last breath exhaled. Then only he has attested to the presence of death, the translator is granted permission to turn the last page and begin at the first. Waking. Writers write or try to write for all time. Translators more modestly for their own generation. There is an English Proust for the Edwardians, another for World War II veterans, yet another for the age of electronics. The 19th century Portuguese have been recalled from their sleep in the now united Europe, and Shakespeare is awoken in China after Mao. New readers require new versions of the classics in order to make them their contemporaries. The business of translators is bringing literature up to date. And yet translators hold a secret hope. They may be translating for the here and now and using vocabularies coined for present usage, which their authors could not have known, but translators hope for more. Embedded in every translation is the desire to address not just the readers on this shoal of time, but also those whose jargons are yet to be invented. New words that will one day open their eyes to new meanings. Translators, consciously or unconsciously, wish they could translate for the future. And in order to do so, something not quite formed not quite clear even to the translator, seeps into the translation, the promise of a meaning yet to come, a meaning yet to awaken like a budding grain, a meaning patiently dreaming for a reader yet to be born. Thank you. Professor Mange Alberto, thank you so much for uh a scintillating lecture, a real uh, rich banquet of thoughts, and I'm sure uh, you will have inspired our audience uh, in many different directions. So can I invite our audience to, uh, if you have any questions to put to uh, Alberto Mangel, uh, do please uh, send them in, and uh, uh, I will do my best to uh, put as many as possible to uh, Alberto Mangel in the time that we have available today. Um, perhaps I can start, though, uh, with a, a reflection on the form of your lecture. It's always um, intriguing how Zeber lecturers respond to our invitation to give a lecture uh, from their personal perspective about literary translation, and you very modestly titled yours, A Few Notes, uh, and uh, you gave us instead a whole philosophy of translation in a handful of words. Um, I, I was wondering whether you would say that you're perhaps on the way, this is a, a pathway um, that you're recommending to our uh, audience. Uh, are you on the way towards a, a grand theory of translation or are you presenting us instead with perhaps something more like a, a, a Borghesian garden of forking paths? Well, God forbid that I should have an all-embracing theory of anything. Um, I, I, I think that uh, with the, 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 the knowledge that I would give the Sebald lecture, I thought that perhaps I would use a, a, a Sebald uh, 
uh, method of approach to literature. Um, that is to say, what Sebald so wonderfully discovered was that through fragmented thought, through uh, interconnectedness in his library, he could give us stories that uh, we, the readers, could follow in a number of ways. Um, of course, as every uh, uh, style, as every system in literature, this is a very ancient system. Uh, the Odyssey is written in, in that way, and so are Plato's dialogues. But I think it's Sibald that brought this system to us in the 20th century. And I thought, well, I can pay homage to Sibald and his extraordinary literature by not uh, trying to put together one uh, a talk, one, one essay, but pick and choose fragments uh, and present them as, as notes. Thank you. Um, I, uh, it seemed to me that you were not, you gave such a, a, a rich collection of examples, but it seemed to me that you were not uh, mentioning uh, works that you yourself have translated and uh, uh, drawing on your, your own translation practice. Um, and so I was wondering, clearly, your uh, remarks uh, were drawn from your uh, your rich experience as a reader and as a translator. And I was just wondering uh, whether um, your the, the uh, points that you've presented to us, the principles that you've uh, delineated there, how they uh, match your own experience as a translator. Uh, I love the way the, the view of translation that came out of your lecture is one of, of an endless process. Uh, of a, a kind of messy process uh, as well. And I just wonder how in practice that translates into uh, a book. Borges uh, said that the concept of a definitive text, whether an original or a translation, belongs only to uh, religion or fatigue. Um, so I've, I've, I've never really completed a translation to my absolute satisfaction. But um, I, I didn't choose examples of my own work because they are far more less interesting than those that are there in the Universal Library. But I, I, can, I can share with you some of those moments. So for instance, uh, translating Marguerite Your Senar, I came to the conclusion and this is what I would recommend to any translator, is don't translate living writers. Um, the dead cannot answer back. Because what I found in the case of Marguerite Yourcenar, who has such a wonderful uh, Baroque style, exuberant style, especially when, uh, when I was translating her Oriental Tales, uh, she was trying to have a, a, a voice that in French uh, would reflect the uh, literary Orientalism that she loved. Translating into English, you always have the danger of purple prose, which is a concept that doesn't exist in French. Nothing is purple prose. <laughs> but um, uh, for uh, reasons that have to do perhaps with uh, that go back to the Counter Reformation, uh, the French uh, allow for an aesthetic style and perhaps the Spanish as well, not the Italians as much, um, uh, uh, that is far more exuberant than what is permissible in English. You have, of course, extraordinary Baroque writers. Uh, um, uh, Sebald's beloved uh, uh, Thomas Brown, for instance, and, and contemporary writers as well. But by and large, it's Hemingway who rules. And so 
you should not, in if you are translating, cram a sentence with 427 adjectives, which you can do in French. So, um, translating your sonar, I try to cut some of that exuberance down, and and she uh, wanted me to put that back, and I feel that. A little pruning would have done the translation a lot of good. Have you ever revisited your own translations then and revised them for uh, second editions? Um, not in the case of, of your scenario. Some short text that I, I, I started translating because I wanted my friends who couldn't read a, a certain language to uh, be aware of that text. So um, when I started translating Morges or um, some uh, lesser known uh, Latin American writers, I did it to share with my friends and I published some of those texts in magazines. And then when I went back to collect those texts for certain anthologies, yes, I, I revised them. Um, and of course, revision allows you to, um, to correct mistakes. Uh, when I translated John Hawkes, his extraordinary novel, Second Skin, and there you have a, a, a Baroque writer of the 20th century, um, I, I didn't know what French letters were and I translated French letters. I had an idea that had something to do with sex. So I translated it as pornographic postcards. So that, that I, I managed to correct in a new edition of that translation, which will appear this year. But um, otherwise, I, I don't often go back to my translations. Thank you. Um, a question uh, has come in from Anne McLean, uh, who says, uh, Hola, Alberto. Uh, saludos from Toronto. Uh, I wonder if you could expand on the idea that authors write for eternity and translators write for contemporary readers. Uh, don't you sometimes seek out a translation contemporary to a work, even if several more recent ones exist? Certainly. Um, and, and by the way, um, Anne McLean is uh, perhaps the foremost, foremost translator of our time. So thank you for the greeting. Um, what are you doing in Toronto? Anyway, we, we'll talk about that later. But um, uh, yes, as a reader, you go to a translation that feels comfortable. Uh, this is part of the many lies that translators give an original text. So, for instance, reading Homer, uh, I, I don't read Greek, um, so I have to resort to translations. I love Pope's translation, but I, uh, I like to read Fagel's. Uh, there are some uh, translators uh, whose style I don't like. So it is as if you could choose a writer and through various personalities that the translators gives that writer. So I can choose um, a better uh, uh, educated Dostoevsky or a more aggressive Dostoevsky, depending on the translator. And every writer writes, uh, presumably, for eternity, but it is the reader who decides whether he will or she will be relegated to oblivion or to salvation. Thank you. Um, a question has come in in, in several parts uh, from James McPherson. So I don't know if we can uh, deal with all the parts, but uh, uh, James McPherson says, Dear Professor Mangel, are there any gifts, sensibilities or experiences that might have rendered some uh, more perceptive, adroit and capable as a translator? And have you felt that there have been a particular group, school or era in which the translation translators have been particularly skilled and or influential as such. Um, let's just uh, pause there 
uh, and mm. that's already a couple of, of questions for you. Uh, that's very difficult to say um, for a number of reasons. The first is to identify certain qualities that uh, would make a translation, uh, a good translation is like identify the qualities that would make a piece of writing a good piece of writing. Somerset Maugham, I think, said when asked, uh, was there any rule uh, for writing a bestseller? He said, yes, there are three rules. Unfortunately, no one knows what they are. The same can be said uh, as regards a, a, a good translation or a good piece of writing. However, um, I, I feel that um, the closer we are to the translation, the le less capable we are uh, of uh, assessing its enduring value. Um, so there are uh, hundreds of uh, excellent translators working today, but uh, while I can in Pope's time pick Pope's translation of Homer um, as the one that I prefer, uh, I cannot do that with contemporary translations. There are some that I like and I some that I don't like, but I don't know exactly what the reason is. I can say that in a translation, what I don't like is literality. Um, what I don't like is hearing the original through the translation. Um, what I don't like is, for instance, what the translators of Borges did in English, um, on, on the one hand, dividing Borges's work into fiction, nonfiction, and poetry, which was something that he fought against all his life, and then uh, mistranslating Borges uh, because Borges, uh, uh, there, there are some writers whose whose style is uh, sufficiently fluid that you can make choices in translating. But other writers uh, have a very definite uh, uh, style. You can't translate Joyce as if he, he were Proust. And this is what they did with Borges, where, for instance, they translated uh, one of his most famous uh, stories Ev, as if instead of being Borges was uh, uh, Carver and uh, Funes el Memorioso uh, was translated in this abominable collection as Funes his memory. And that is not only ugly, it is wrong. There's a final part, in fact, to uh, uh, James McPherson's question, and perhaps you've, you've given us a number of, of uh, uh, examples of uh, uh, translations that you appreciate, but uh, is there a translation that you found particularly wonderful in some way, even exemplary? I don't know, that, that may be just uh, an impossible question. <laughs> well, it depends on what is the original text. Uh, um, for instance, there are no translations of Borges that I find even acceptable, um, in English, I mean. But uh, there are uh, translations of uh, Dante or, or um, uh, Cervantes that I, I like. Um, so, Yes, um, I, I think that I could choose some that are my favorite, but uh, it's easier to say when I don't like a translation. I wonder if we could return to your wonderful um, presentation of the words. Um, I was struck by how, uh, how high uh, the picture that emerges from your lecture, how high the stakes are for um, translators. Um, 
translators have, I, I love the variety of definitions and descriptions uh, that you gave. The translator, uh, among other things, uh, comes across as a kind of perhaps a, a, a priest or, uh, on the other hand, an autocratic censor. Um, so many of your words relate to ethical issues. Um, Pure. I think literature is an ethical liter issue. <laughs> well, that was that was my question, really. Um, uh, the it, clearly the the ethical uh, has a uh, a, uh, a paramount place for you in your vision mm -hmm. of the the role of the translator. I would say I would go further and say that that um, uh, literature uh, poses an ethical question. Uh, when we speak of uh, censoring a text because of uh, racism or sexism or anything that's not ethically acceptable, I don't think we are talking about great literature. This is a, 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 a private belief. I don't know how far I can sustain it. But I think that good literature cannot be amoral, um, cannot be immoral either. I think that there is something in good literature that demands for enough ambiguity uh, that the, the text escapes the boundaries of prejudice. So if you look at the Merchant of Venice and you say this is uh, uh, anti-Semitic, you are not seeing the characters in the depth that Shakespeare is giving them. There is sufficient ambiguity in the story to go beyond that uh, uh, superficial interpretation. I, I saw a uh, marvelous production of The Taming of the Shrew. Um, I can't think of a more difficult play to stage at uh, this moment of Me Too and, and uh, uh, important feminist opinion. And so what the director uh, did found in Shakespeare was that ambiguity. In the last scene where Kate instructs the other wives as to why they should uh, 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 obey their husbands and do what the husbands say, the actress had tears running down her cheek. It was as if you were watching a woman being tortured and then pronouncing those words under torture. That is the genius of the director who found that interpretation, but that is in Shakespeare. And that's why that is a, a great piece of literature. So the ethical then extends not not only to uh, the writer, to the translator, but to the reader, clearly, to the director, to the actor, in all these roles for you. Absolutely. A absolutely. We all have an ethical responsibility when we open a book. Um, furthermore, the, uh, the translator's responsibility, and this is why I don't like literal translation, is because a translator has, in a sense, a more difficult uh, task than the writer. The writer doesn't need, and in fact, usually doesn't know why uh, he or she chooses a word um, and puts them in a certain order and tells a certain story in a certain way. It It, it is there, and uh, if it works, it works, and if it doesn't work, it doesn't work, and there is no amount of going to creative writing courses that will produce uh, a Shakespeare. But the translator takes whatever has been uh, finished and then has go, to go into the work and find those secret uh, 
strategies and structures and uh, uh, techniques, and not only find them, but then transform them into the possibilities that his or her language allow for. Um, so there are translations that seem impossible, but suddenly the translator uh, performs a, a miracle. Uh, Roy Campbell's translations of St. John of the Cross, who I normally would say is impossible to translate because it's it's pure music with a few words a small vocabulary uh he managed to do that you 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 read those translations and you you know you're reading a masterpiece so um it, would you say then that the translator is uh caught between some of your Keywords. I, I'm just thinking about um, honesty and betrayal, for example. Um, there's there's clearly a tension there. Is it that a, a, a translator uh, uh, aims for honesty but is always bound to betray? Um, it depends on the definition of those words, which is, of course, a, a question that a translator needs to ask. What is the definition of the word when you use the word honesty, when you use the word betrayal? How do you translate them? Um, because uh, a translation uh, requires betrayal. If, if you are... Uh, um, 100% faithful to uh, the original text, the only possible translation is the original text, is doing what Pierre Menard does in Borges' story, uh, writing Don Quixote with the same words, and then allowing the reader to say, yes, but it's written in the 20th century, so it means something else, but the words are the same. Um, so, the, the translator has to accept that in order to be honest, the translator has to betray because language requires it. Thank you. So it, it is, it does effectively resolve into a paradox. Um, as all best literature does. A question from Lee Hyde. Um, again, it's a question in, in several parts. Um, would it be possible to comment on the place of rhythm, pace, and sound? Uh, those are not the, 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 all the parts, uh, but uh, let's pause there. Um, rhythm, um, pace, and sound. Well, these are parts of, of, of a language, of any language. Every, every language has its, its rhythm, its music, its sounds. So um, the, the question of translation, I think, is reflected in a, 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 a medieval riddle, which is if you uh, take you and replace your right hand and then replace your left hand and replace your feet and so on until you replace every element in your body. Are you still you? The translator does that with the original. The translator takes the original and replaces the words, replaces the syntax, replaces the grammar, replaces the music, replaces the context. And is it still uh, Dostoevsky's novel in French or English or Swahili. Um, only the translator can answer that question because if the translation works, for want of a better word, the reader feels that the music and the rhythm is there without knowing the music and the rhythm of the original. Uh, so it, it, it depends on what the reader receives. And the reader gives it uh, his or her seal of approval. Uh, James 
Firebrace asked uh, simply, can you say something about the challenges of translating poetry? I think you've begun to uh, answer that question already, but perhaps uh, if I could invite you to say a little more about translating poetry in particular. Um, my impulse is to say that there is no difference in translating poetry to translating an essay or or uh, a, a, another piece of prose, um, as we know, prose has its its rhythm, its cadences, its uh, uh, its internal uh, music, uh, as does poetry. The difficulty I think arises when, for instance, the poem rhymes, and there there is a mechanical aspect that you can or you cannot preserve. I personally, as a reader, don't like translations of rhymed poetry that don't rhyme. I think that uh, rhyme is perhaps more important than uh, the sense of the, of the original. And, and I will say why. Um, uh, uh, when the poet writes um, uh, whatever, uh, uh, I, I eat my peas with honey, I've done it all my life, it tastes a little funny, but it keeps them on my knife, mm -hmm. the poet doesn't say uh, uh, fork, says knife. Or, or spoon if it rhymed with that word. So the choice in order to produce the rhyme is dictated by uh, uh, the, the rhyme itself, not by the sense of that word. So I think in that case, the translator is allowed to perform this uh, 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 same um, strategy uh, to choose a word that in the translation will rhyme, even if it is not exactly the same word of the original. I think four poems that rhyme, rhyme is essential in the translation. Thank you. Um, a follow-up question from uh, James McPherson. Um, what are your impressions of translations of your own work? Um, are you uh, impressed by them? Surprised? Frustrated? Um, I, I, I'm very impressed at the courage and patience and uh, uh, will of the translator. Um, with translations in languages that I can read, I usually um, work with a translator in the sense that I change things. I think that uh, when you write, especially essays uh, in one language, you assume a certain cultural shared vocabulary that disappears in the translation. So, for instance, uh, when I'm writing for uh, an American audience, I've gotten accustomed to having to explain the French writer Gustave Flaubert when I mention Flaubert. That's totally unthinkable in Spanish or Italian or, or German. But even more than that, when I, for instance, uh, take the example of, if I'm writing about translation, the translation of the King James Bible, I would try and find another similar example uh, in, in, in Spanish or, or, or French that um, can show the same process uh, in that language. So I will write something different and hand it over to the translator to put in, in the book. Of course, translations into languages that I 
can't read. I have no idea, and I trust the translator, and I, I trust the translator to the point of trusting that it is my book when I have an edition in Korean. Uh, thank you. A, a question from uh, Rebecca DeWald. Um, I have a question uh, about your bilingual translation practice. Um, it struck me in the way that you spoke about what you like in Pope's translation of the Odyssey and about your dislike of all English Borges translations, uh, that the difference is also that Pope did not translate from one of your languages, the languages you translate into. Um, do English and Spanish occupy different parts in your translation practice, your brain, and dare I say, is one closer to your heart. The, the example of Pope makes me smile because nor did Pope, he had, didn't translate from the Greek. <laughs> he had no Greek. So, um, but yes, I understand the, the, the question. Um, in uh, certain cases where I know the original, I can't help but um, hearing the echo of the original in the translation. But sometimes when the translation is very good, that echo disappears. In Anne McLean's translations, um, uh, that happens. I read her translations as if they had been written in English, and that I find miraculous. But, uh, of course, in languages that I don't know, I can only judge from what I'm reading. And so I judge only from the translation without comparison to the original. Thank you. A, a question from Flo, um, who says, wonderful lecture, thank you. For an ordinary reader who cannot read in the original language, we don't know if the translation is good or bad. What advice would you give about how to identify a good translation, please? Trust your ear. Trust your ear. Just uh, read as if you were reading in your language, because it is in your language. You know, um, a, a prejudice that has been so long established that we don't recognize it as a prejudice is that the translator is subservient to the text. The translator is the author of the text you are reading. You are not reading Dostoevsky. You are reading a translation of Dostoevsky in the hand of the translator whose name should be on the cover, Olga Tucharkuk has now demanded that her translator's name be on the cover, which is uh, uh, normal. It's the, it, it, it is the truth of the book. The book has been written by the translator, inspired by the original. And so, um, Sometimes those translations are called versions, or uh, I like the the use of the verb Englished, Englished by so and so, and I, I think that's only fair. We are, I'm afraid, coming to the end of our time, but uh, there have been a number of. Uh, not questions, but just uh, um, expressions of uh, admiration in the uh, in the audience response. Uh, Chris Arthur uh, said, "Not a question, but thank you for a, a fascinating lecture, and thanks also for providing the epigraph for uh, an essay collection of of, uh, of his uh, reading life. Use um, the extract from your history, a history of reading." Uh, Maria Figuera. Uh, says, I don't have any question. I'm delighted uh, with Professor Mangel's lecture. I'm a Portuguese translator and have learned more in these 45 minutes uh, than perhaps in five years of work. Thank you so much. Um, I have uh, uh, a final question about the, uh, again, about your own translation practice and about the relation between your translation work and the 
uh, all the other uh, kinds of writing uh, that you are engaged in. Um, in an interview that I uh, read, um, you gave a long list of writers who you would still like to translate. Um, and I'm, I'm just wondering uh, what part then translation is going to play uh, in your own activity then in, in future. Um, you talk about the future as a, it extending for uh, thousands of years. Um, if if I had um, uh, the possibility of being immortal, perhaps I would dedicate a, a good chunk of my time to translating. Because as I said before, when you translate, you author the book. And um, a, a translation will take me as long as uh, writing a, a, a book of my own. So I have to make a choice. Sometimes the choice in the past was made because I needed the money, uh, however little a translator is paid, and sometimes for the joy of the text when I translated John Hawkes is what just for the immense pleasure of um, making that writer uh, uh, available to the um, Spanish-speaking public. Uh, but of course, if I had years and years ahead of me, then there would be a, a number of writers I would like to translate. One, one book that I would love to translate is The Wind in the Willows into Spanish. Well, we can look forward to that uh, very much and to all uh, the, uh, the, the work uh, that is forthcoming. I mentioned uh, the Maimonides uh, biography, which is forthcoming from Yale. Um, and your center is opening uh, next year? Mar uh, April 25th. 2024, which marks the 50 years of democracy in Portugal. Wonderful. That's a, a date for everyone's uh, diary then. Uh, You're all invited. Thank you, Professor Mangel Alberto. Thank you so much for giving uh, the Zebat Lecture 2023. It was a, a wonderful lecture. And thank you also for the uh, the generosity of your, your time in, in answering uh, our audience questions. Thank you to our uh, audience for those questions. Um, uh, and on behalf of our audience, can I thank you uh, most warmly for a wonderful Zebat Lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.